Hello, everyone. This is the uh, Inglewood Transportation Advisory Committee meeting for what would be Thursday, May 14th, 2020. The time is 4.05 p.m. Uh, thanks again for everybody being able to attend, even in the, our virtual world here. I hope everybody's doing well. So, Lorraine, there you go. If, Lorraine, were you putting up the agenda right now or? Yes. Okay. We'll do a roll call first, I guess, as well. Okay. Chair Sarno? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Here. Vice, Vice Chair Lewis? Here. Member Dietrich? Here. Member Knatson? Here. Member O'Connell? Here. Member Plasters? Mayor Pro Tem Sierra? Here. Director, Director DeAndrea? Here. Traffic Engineer Norris? Here. Traffic Ops Groth? Here. Sergeant McKay? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Great. I will, I will share my screen. Can everybody hey, hey. see it okay? I can, Lorraine. I'm, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Okay. Uh, so basically, yeah, this meeting is called to order now. Uh, first order of business would be the, oh. Hold on a second here. Would be approval of the meeting minutes uh, from February 13, 2020. No, I'm sorry, this would be from March. Correct. Can you scroll up just a little bit, Lorraine? Yeah, March 12, 2020. Uh, so that would be the first order of business here is approval of those minutes. If everyone has had an opportunity to view the minutes, and if there's any comments at this time, please. I move to approve down. the minutes. This is Chris Thanks, Diedrich. Man. All right. I second do we have Patrick a, Lewis. I was gonna say, do we have a second? Very good, Patrick, second it. Okay, so we'll call a vote. Uh, first would be the eyes. Chris Dietrich, aye. Aye. Patrick Lewis, aye. Tiffany O'Connell, aye. Okay. Ed Canadison, aye. And Neil Sarno, aye. So any nays? No nays. And so the eyes have it. And so the agenda has been approved. And say, Neil, we'll back. if, if oh, I sorry, could suggest, um, Lorraine sure. can call out the members and they can respond too if you want to do it that way. For We could do that as well too, Maria, sure. Yeah. This is kind of our test run here on this, but yeah, that would work just fine. So, all right. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Chair Sarno. Yes. Vice Chair Lewis. Yes. Member Dietrich. Yes. Member Canadison. Yes. Member O'Connell. Yes. Pro Tem Mayor Sierra. I say I wouldn't have a vote on this. Okay. All right. I will now turn over the sharing to John.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's been a quite a number of years since I've been uh, with your group. And so uh, a guy has asked me to come tonight to kind of give you in, to fill you in on how, where we are with our bicycle and pedestrian planning efforts. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen, the PowerPoint here. I can find it. Hmm. There. Okay. All right, well, first I'd like to start off with just a little bit of historical context of, of bicycle planning in Inglewood. Uh, I know that a quite a number of you are, are newer to ETAC, so that you probably haven't seen this before. Uh, so I started with the city back in 2001, and I was hired mostly to help out with a new comprehensive plan, our first comprehensive plan for the city since 1979. Uh, once that was finished, uh, I was looking around in our community development library and I found this bicycle plan from 1981. And uh, sure enough, that is exactly what they did. They signed uh, a couple of different routes through Inglewood to connect from Denver to Littleton and from Denver to Denver East and West. Uh, and Denver had already laid out Dartmouth as that route, so Inglewood continued it. Did other folks lose audio or just me? Yeah, yeah. no, I think, John, John, we lost you for a second, John. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can send him a message. Uh... <laughs> how, do we, how do we let john know hi john he's maybe got powerpoint on his full screen could be uh um he's just so low, though, isn't he? he's yeah so i think he's starting oh. to realize that he's not okay let's just ad lib and what do we think he's saying <laughs> well, do we have any good lip readers here? No? Okay. So the way, guy, do you happen to have his, his um, uh, uh, text or an email or a phone number for him where you could text him? Yeah, I withdrew his, his hosting, so hopefully he'll realize that. By the way, Neil, this is old Daniel. Do we happen to have a member from the public that wanted to speak? I believe if Jennifer, who's on the line here, I believe. Oh, and there's Brienne. She's, she's here as well. Jennifer, did you want to speak? Oh, uh, no, not at this point. Thank you. Just listening. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. okay, now we can hear yeah, you. Can. Let me put you back as the host, okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so you didn't hear anything that I was saying, correct? Just the first maybe couple sentences there, John. You okay. said you found the plan in the library, and yeah. that's okay, about where we you. lost you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, let me go back to that slide here. Okay, uh, so yes, I found this plan in the library, uh, it dates back from 1981, and uh, 
this is what they actually implemented in the field. Uh, they were looking to connect in, from Denver to Littleton, north to south, and from Denver to the east to Denver to the west. And Denver had already laid out Dartmouth as that route, so Inglewood continued that route through the city and then chose Sherman basically as the main spine, north south, uh, cutting over to the, to the west, to Windermere, then down into Littleton. And you may notice that on this map, the Mary Carter Greenway was, had not been constructed yet. So uh, that didn't take place until the sometime after this plan, the 80s. And then after that, uh, bicycle planning started moving more towards trying to connect to that new Mary Carter Greenway. And so in the, I think it was in the 90s, they just constructed the Little Dry Creek Trail and the Big Dry Creek Trail. Uh, so being a bi avid, avid bicyclist, um, I kind of felt like we really needed something to have a plan to improve the bicycle system. And there was somebody in Public Works at the time who was also an avid bi bicyclist. So we uh, went to our supervisors and pitched the idea, can we make a, our own in-house plan that won't cost the city anything? And they gave us our blessing. And so we came up with the, this bicycle plan in 2004. And we added a lot of uh, routes in purple to the existing orange routes there on the left. And what we were trying to do is connect the dots to surrounding cities, local parks and schools, the light rail stations, central business district, and the medical district. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, Inglewood bicycle planning history, what went wrong? Uh, so after that plan was adopted, uh, we had some housing issues, housing prices were starting to get high and people were starting to max out credit and uh, there was a financial meltdown equals a great recession, foreclosures and no money for bicycle improvements. <laughs> Uh, funding opportunity. We lost you again. Lorraine, could you uh, pull back presenter ability so that he can know about this? John, we lost you again. I'll call him. I have his number now. John, can you hear us? I called and texted them, but I didn't get an answer. So, Lorraine, can you turn off yeah. his, um, or do you have the ability to unmute him or mute him? Maybe he'll realize. I do not, Maria. I only have the ability to mute him. I oh. did take him off as co host, so. Hmm. It could work well um, to have John like call into the Zoom. I think that that's enabled on this meeting. And then maybe his phone audio would pick up a little better than his computer, uh, computer audio. Chris likes that idea. Um, another thought that I had was that perhaps um, we could uh, move to the next item on the agenda, 
um, just to keep rolling. And then John could work on figuring out, like somebody could email him and, and um, help him figure out that dial-in thing um, while we talk about the next topic. Yeah, I think we could do that. Okay. If there's just something that shows up on his screen, I would be able to let him know that he's not being heard. That would be helpful, yeah. Maria, did you want to share your screen for the second item? I know I kind of brought it up okay. last second, but. That's great. <clears throat> All right, let me, let me give you control, Maria. Okay. All right, can you guys see that? T-Rex? Yeah. Yes. Great, okay. So I, I did attach this presentation. This, is, um, this came to us from Denver, their transportation and infrastructure group. And this is something that they've implemented within the city. So I was just gonna buzz through it real quickly. Um, this, is this was attached to the agenda. But the idea was is that basically they're seeing, experiencing a lot of overcrowding as people want to get out, especially as it got nice out, they wanted to be in parks, they wanted to be, you know, basically out of their house, and there wasn't enough green space to accommodate all of that. So they were looking into and have done um, this to actually close off some streets to through traffic only to allow additional space for people to be outside while also maintaining that six foot social distancing. So um, the idea here, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit to show a map. They went through a lot of different methodologies, but you can see here on the photo, you know, the idea would be, as you see in the picture here, the road is closed to through traffic. People are still parking. You, they could still get into their driveways, that sort of thing. But, I, and I would put more than just one barrier, but we'd put, you know, a couple of barriers up. Again, cars could drive through at a slower pace, but it's just giving more space. Maybe somebody brings out, you know, a couple of lawn chairs or they bring their dog and they, you know, again, still keeping that social distance, but they're able to talk with their neighbors and have that additional space. So we could do this pretty easily. Um, the idea was that we'd have, uh, could reach out to a company, buy or rent some of these barricades. We do have about 30 available in house. Um, but we most likely rent some of those and identify some streets where we could put these up. And that's my next slide or presentation, which is also in your packet. You can see here, they created some special signage, which we could do something similar, maybe make this unique to Englewood. Um, just reminding people as they came into those streets that they still need to, uh, for vehicles, they still have to be aware that vehicles may be driving through. And then secondly, that they need to stay apart from each other with that six feet. So the locations I had originally identified, this first one is Duncan Park along the east side. There's about two blocks there. And so again, if you have a driveway off of Pearl Street, you could still drive through here. The garbage um, trucks could still drive through if they pick up from the street side. So it's really just that, again, trying to limit the amount of traffic and give extra space to pedestrians. So this is, um, Duncan is an area where you can bring your dogs. So again, the, our dog park was shut down for a while and this would give another area for people to bring their dogs and play. The next location was at Jason Park. Again, this is an area where you can bring your dogs in the east and part of the north route would potentially, could potentially be closed off here. That would also limit the amount of parking probably in the parking lot um, and to just give additional space. And then finally, Bates Logan along the north side here along Bates Avenue, again, an extension of that parks area. There has also been some discussion with downtown businesses about either using the space like the parking spaces in front of their business, closing them off in some way to maybe give more space for eating areas and or congregating um, as well as potentially some of the parking lots downtown. So I'll just open it back up to the group to talk about that, or if Mayor Pro Tem, you wanna make any additional comments about that. 
Thank you, Maria. I'm uh, going back and forth between the uh, two slides. Yeah, I, I thought that this would be very interesting. Obviously, we're a little bit late to the game when it comes to closing off streets uh, uh, due to the stay-at-home order. Uh, but I, at the very least, I, I, I wanted to get this in front of the committee. Uh, one, they provided us their methodology for what kind, you know, what streets would make sense. Uh, I know uh, Director uh, DeAndre um, and staff have already come up with a few ideas, but I, at the very least, I wanted to provide that information to you. Uh, secondly, uh, we also have now contacts within Denver and um, what are the name of the, the committees, uh, Maria? But um, anyway, we have contacts there that, that provide, can provide us a little bit of information in terms of a survey that they put together for the uh, community at large to kind of identify whether or not they would be open to uh, doing this more on a permanent level uh, once we get into a more normal state. Uh, so that's something that maybe we can look into. But yeah, just uh, overall, I just wanted the committee to have information about some of the steps that they took. Uh, and I'm glad, uh, Director DeAndre, that you also threw in uh, some of the businesses wanting to close off uh, portions of uh, adjacent areas for eating space. Uh, because I also was thinking of using something similar for that type of, uh, uh, you know, as we move towards the safer at home uh, model. But um, yeah, so any thoughts from the committee overall regarding uh, what Director DeAndre presented? I would say um, just anecdotally, my experience from walking around is that it feels like a lot of people are doing this already, um, even without signage out. Um, I see a lot of folks just walking down the middle of a street or, you know, people sitting on their driveway and people will set up lawn chairs in the street in front of that. Um, it, I, so uh, between Dartmouth and Floyd on Eastman, um, on the, uh, I guess it's the east side of Charles Hay School, Eastman runs all the way over to until it kind of dead ends into Ray Street. And Eastman as a whole is not used very much for car traffic because it doesn't, it, it dead ends on two ends of like six block section. Um, so a lot of folks are just using that the way that is being proposed here. So it seems like if we were to put up some, um, put up some signage and some, uh, some, I'm forgetting the Jersey barriers or something. Is that what these are called? Um, then that could be helpful to make it a more official use and encourage more people to do it and, and, and uh, reduce the likelihood of cars speeding down that road as if um, people weren't there. Yeah, they just be those, what we call type three type barriers. Yeah. yeah. For so, Broadway, we yeah. might want to consider something more substantial like a barricade, Commissioner. I, I'm totally in support of this idea. You know, one of the things that I was going to bring up in uh, chair or committee person's choice was uh, the number of people that we've been seeing out on the sidewalks and and actively watching them, you know, cross the street so they don't have to walk past people. And, uh, uh, you know, that was one of the things some of my neighbors brought up as well. So I think this is a very much appropriate thing to be talking about. And and I think it it's a great idea. I'm, I'm really interested in, in seeing how it works out. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at a couple of the maps of the spots where um, the suggested places were. I think it was pretty well thought out uh, as well. You know, no major thoroughfares or anything on there. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And then as a corollary, I feel like it's sort of a secondary topic, but the, uh, you know, street space or sidewalk space for restaurants to be outside, I think that's also very appropriate to be talking about um, from our Community as well, so I'm not sure if we want to address. The, we probably should address them both right now, uh, but I'd love to hear more about what some of the other committee members think. I had the opportunity to. Um, I passed by. I think it's from East High School going west there in Denver, which would be 16th Street there, and uh, they had that portion of that blocked off, and I just think that it looked to be uh, something beneficial for. The people in that neighborhood there to be able to access the streets and in that capacity so i also uh, appreciate i think what was put together in terms of criteria uh, to to have some sort of understanding of what is more uh you know allowable as opposed to just kind of arbitrary uh so i i totally am supportive of it as well
Do we okay. know what sort of a time frame we're looking at to get something like this implemented? We would need to take this back to council to get um, authorization from them. But I think, you know, while we're in the process of scheduling that, we could certainly be developing the specialized signage and doing some outreach to the community about that. So I would say within a matter of weeks, I would hope we could do this. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, for your contacts in Denver, were you able to get any feedback from them on, on what their thoughts were about the response from the community? It seems like there was a positive uh, response from the community. Uh, I'm not sure if they provide, if they asked for additional surveys after they went into effect uh, to get that level of uh, detail. Uh, but obviously just from, from people that were taking advantage of it, you would think that they, they, they were having a positive, uh, uh, positive reception to, to this. And I, I guess one thing I did want to add about uh, the conversation is that one thing I noticed because I did go down 16th uh, and some of the other areas like Bayard, right around Clarkson, uh, obviously just north of Wash Park, there's another street closure there that happened on the second wave for them. Um, what I noticed most though, was that they did place these in areas that have higher level of density, which we don't happen to have that level of density here within the city of Inglewood. Um, one thing that I would want to see before implementing anything was actually getting responses, at least from the neighbors that are directly adjacent uh, to these proposed uh, closures uh, and just seeing what their what thoughts would be on this. So. Uh, Again, we, initially we got this from them just after the stay at home order from Denver. Um, I think that that probably would have been the best time to take, a, take action. Um, but as um, uh, Greg Knetson stated, uh, I'm still seeing it because I'm right off of Bates Logan Park. I am seeing people going into the street to keep the social distancing whenever they do encounter another couple coming from the opposite direction. So. I think it's important to frame it as um, not closing the streets, but really opening them because it's opening them up to so many more possibilities than just car traffic. So I'm just, I'm 100% for it. I think it's great. And that's a great point that you're still allowing uh, neighborhood traffic and um, obviously anybody that's doing food delivery, they're still able to go through, but obviously it, it, it's a great point that it isn't uh, closing off the street. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, from the council's standpoint, you know, what, uh, you know, what would they need to see in order to be comfortable moving forward or what sort of, uh, you know, whether it's a recommendation or just a thumbs up or from us and, and from that standpoint also like any additional information that they would need to be comfortable moving forward with something like this. I wouldn't be able to speak for all the council, but at least from my point of view, it is always uh, citizen input and just making sure that the decision was well thought out and not necessarily just a uh, knee jerk reaction. So I think citizen input, I think is where, um, is, is I think the, something that council definitely requires and just additional uh, findings that, that would um, lead to why we decided to go with the recommendation we did. And also would it be something in terms of a location by location basis, or would it be several? I think Maria just showed two or three locations at least there and kind of a grouping at once, or, you know, and then maybe adding on to it as time passes. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate your guys' input if there's other locations. Um, and to Mayor Pro Tem's point, staff could certainly you know, send out a postcard relatively quickly and e easily to have them to solicit that feedback, positive or negative on those ideas. But if you have other locations, that was, these were just kind of, you know, in keeping with the kind of the guidelines that Denver had done, we didn't go through anything quite as extensive, but just looking at some potential locations, the, those three seemed like that kind of stood out, but we can certainly pursue more. 
Um, I, there is a survey that um, the Denver Bike or Denver Street Partnership put together um, asking people about the shared streets after they've been implemented. And um, my understanding is that the, um, the comments so far have been overwhelmingly supportive and that most people want to keep it after the pandemic, you know, dies down. So people are super stoked about it. Yeah, I was going to mention um, some research um, looking at just the section of 16th from uh, City Park Esplanade to Lincoln and the section of 11th from Cheeseman Park to Lincoln. Uh, there's some analysis by Derek Co from SPIN, um, which is a scooter share company. But what they found is that there was an increase in the use of those streets, 330% um, on 16th Avenue and 1,394% um, on 11th. Um, so there's a, a, a huge increase in the amount that people are able to get out, um, which I think is you know, really beneficial for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, exposure to sun for vitamin D, um, for you know, just some fresh air and happiness, mental health. Um, there's a lot of reasons why giving people space to get out safely without being overcrowded is helpful. And it seems like the response in terms of you know, feet on the street and people actually using it is very positive based on those numbers. It's, it's also interesting to me thinking about like, does Englewood have a similar density? Um, 16th Avenue and 11th Avenue are, um, you know, they're not like, they're not surrounded by apartment buildings. Some of them have low rises, which are I think comparable to some of the low rise apartments that we have in downtown Englewood. Um, but they also have a mix of like single family homes, duplexes, um, structures like that. So it's not too different from a lot of the areas in Englewood. I'm a little curious here. Um, I, I see the, you know, the recommendations for Denver. Some of it is adjacent to parks. A lot of it is not adjacent to parks. And it looked like the recommendations for Inglewood here was sort of like park overflow adjacent to parks. And I'm just curious if they're, you know, not knowing the whole process that went into this, I'm kind of curious if uh, there was some thought into picking areas that maybe are not adjacent to the parks where, uh, you know, maybe it could serve some people who may have to travel further to the parks. Director yeah. DeAndre, were you gonna answer that or? Um, I, I guess we can certainly look at that. You know, I, that was just my first stab. So if there's an interest in, and, and uh, I didn't mention to the commission, but those three park locations were also, one was kind of in the north, one was Jason's in the middle, and then Duncan's to the south and right. So I thought that was a little bit of a spread, but if we wanted to look at something where it was just a street not adjacent to a park, we could come up with some criteria as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to explore that because some of our parks are not necessarily in the, the most dense parts of town. So I'm thinking around, you know, some of the corridors that have the higher density housing, um, if it might make sense to do something like that a little closer to those areas. And, and not to necessarily swap out one of the other ones for one of those areas, but more along the lines of additional opportunities. I, I think what you I think what you guys have is a great great starting point, and I think we could probably even do a little more depending on what the budget and uh, you know city council is comfortable with. And Director DeAndre, in terms of budgetary, it's it's not really an additional cost. I guess it's just uh, the. Um, just the labor and the um, placement of those, um, uh, whatever they're called, uh, on those specific streets, correct? Barricades, yeah, there'd be three barricades. Yeah, there'd be okay. um, the rental of those, and then if we create some specialized signage around it, but yeah, uh, putting them out and then probably checking them, you know, each day just to that nobody's knocked them out of the way and that they're still up. So it's a fairly minimal cost, but it sounds like it would also be eligible for our um, potential reimbursement through the federal government too, for something like this. Very good. Well, I think this is a great idea, especially if people are already doing that now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what uh, I guess uh, the other sort of part of the subject was talking about potentially some outdoor seating or, you know, taking away from some of the public space in order to allow for, you know, expanded restaurant reopening and some things here. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more since we're on that subject right now. Um, has the city discussed on their end sort of what they might have for an idea for that? Or has there been a lot of discussion in there? I'd, I'd love to hear any background that you guys have at this point. Yes, we've been talking with some businesses um, who are interested in using, you know, either the parking, let's say along Broadway, if you can envision that, going out into the right of way. So using the parking spaces adjacent to their business and perhaps some of the sidewalk, although we'd have to maintain at least a space for ADA, but relaxing our guidelines in terms of how they use the, you know, there is a process to do like a sidewalk um, seating area, but we try and streamline that as much as possible to create a, a temporary area where they could do that safely and um, get that up and running quickly. So we have had some interest. The, you know what, where the area is also of Paseo, that's that little walkway um, between the buildings, uh, I forget, I think that's the 3400 block of Broadway, is using that space as well to allow for gatherings there. So we're actively looking into that as well. And Director DeAndre, I guess I should probably just uh, make you aware, I also had a conversation with the city manager today. And actually this has been a conversation that I, I believe myself and the mayor had uh, a few weeks back, but we were also wondering, would it be possible to close off maybe the 3400 block of Broadway, uh, whether it's just weekends uh, or specific times? Um, and our thinking behind that was obviously just provide more space. Um, obviously, we want people to be able to social distance. Um, there's also been requests that we also use, uh, which would be Lincoln on the 3400 block of Lincoln using that space as well or the parking, parking lot in that area for open space. But I'll be raising a council request on what the pros and cons would be of, of doing that if it's even possible. Uh, I guess my concern would be on that and just one of the cons would be, would it be, would people be less likely to venture into that area for to go orders if they knew mm -hmm. that there was gonna be an issue parking, uh, that would be one of the questions that we would obviously have to raise for the businesses that um, that I was obviously would take advantage of this, but whether or not there's some concerns with uh, less traffic overall in that area, if there is more traffic. I think for a street like if we were to close down Broadway, we, you know, as opposed to this other, um, the other applications we've just been talking about that there we would have to restrict traffic, I think, the through traffic probably, and so reroute them around the street in some fashion. But I definitely could, we could definitely consider that. But yeah, there's probably some cons to that concept too. Okay. Well, is there, is this something right now that the committee would like to vote on at this, at this moment or? I don't know if there's I saw a thumbs up from Chris. Well, I, I think just, uh, just I guess a comment since we are talking about the subject is that we've only really identified the 3400 block of South Broadway and obviously there's commerce and restaurants across the entire city. Um, if anybody has any other ideas of how to take advantage of other portions of, this, uh, of the city, you know, it, in a perfect world, I would love to use Hampton, but obviously Hampton kind of leads into Swedish and whether or not, um, obviously that would be an issue. But I'm just kind of curious um, if anybody has any other thoughts of other parts of the city that may benefit from this. Yeah, you know, I think uh, <laughs> I'm sure Guy is going to have some great input on uh, the traffic flow on Broadway <laughs> for the closure there or even uh, you know, narrowing it down or something. But I, I think even some of those adjacent areas around there, whether it's you know, Hampton on the west side of Broadway, um, I, I like that idea of Lincoln or potentially a coma, something sort of in that central business area would be definitely beneficial. Um, and, and I think people would be pretty, pretty welcome to the idea of that, especially if it was coupled with you know, some uh, expanded outdoor seating or something like that, I think it would be very well received. And, uh, you know, I, I think, Nathaniel, your comment on the parking is very valid. 
uh, for people coming down and being able to access those areas, definitely something that should be considered, um, you know, in the way that this might be executed. Yeah, because Acoma, how it runs in a Hamden, that also has a walkthrough where you go past Zomo. That would be a great area to shut down because there's no traffic there. A great area to open up, you mean? Oh, yeah. Sorry, close down for cars. Open up. Yeah, to open up. <laughs> And I think perhaps what we could do is um, have a motion that's just encouraging exploration of this idea. Um, and, and then that could give council just our perspective and uh, you know, we're, it's not like we're making specific recommendations. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Greg. So um, I have one question for Ian Plasters here. Um, for the, uh, this is for um, uh, Maria primarily um, for for the Denver plan, when they implemented these, um, closing off the roads to f to allow for foot traffic and bikes, did they encounter any pushback from residents that live on that street, um, saying, you know, that they that they are now exposed more to the virus, their kids can't mm -hmm. play in the front yard, something like that? I I have not talked talked to the staff specifically. Um, but I will certainly, if there's some, which it sounds like there's interest here, we will reach out to Denver and ask about that. Because some people also who are in favor of it before it gets implemented can sometimes, you know, um, unintended consequences might not be in support after. So I'll see what they've done and ask that question specifically before okay. we go back to council. Okay, I think, um, mm -hmm. is there any other additional comments or questions that anyone has on this topic? I'd like to make a motion. Okay, Chris. <laughs> I, I uh, would like to make a motion that the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee uh, is in support of the city furthering um, research and uh, whatever may be necessary into moving these two subjects forward. Uh, I, I think I'd like to see them do, well, I'm getting a little long in the motion here, sorry. The motion is to, uh, for the committee to uh, propose that the city continue moving forward and uh, proceed with their plan on these two items. Okay. Can we officially call this, uh, is there a name for this, Mar uh, Maria, perhaps T-Rex, or is that the official yeah, probably, name for this? Um, some sort of, I, I really like the idea of playing on that opening up idea, you know, okay. with the signage. So opening up to, you know, neighborhoods, neighborhoods opening up, something like that. But you know, I think I called this temporary street closures, something boring that an engineer would come up with. So. Okay, right. <laughs> but I, right. I, I would, you know, let's call it temporary street closures for now and, and we'll work on some fun graphics and uh, maybe a tagline. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll amend that. Um, how about temporary recreation streets? That's what Denver was calling theirs. Rather than a closure, it's got a better sound to it. Yeah. Um, so amended, amended motion is, um, uh, ETAC is in support of the city continuing with their actions to implement temporary recreation streets. Do we have a second for that motion? I second. Okay. We have a second. So we'll call a vote. Uh, we would have discussion as to oh, any, I'm sorry. any adjustments or, or conversation about the motion. I hear none at this time. So we'll move forward with a vote. Uh, first would be the the ayes. Chair Sarno? Yes. Vice Chair Lewis? Yes. Sorry. Member Dietrich? Yes. Member Knapson? I don't see Greg anymore. Um, 
my screen here. Sounds yeah. like an abs abstention. Yeah, I don't see yeah. him there. Okay. Um, Oh, and this was Greg's idea. <laughs> yeah, he dropped off. Okay. Member O'Connell? Yes. Okay. All right. I think all, there's also uh, Brienne also, correct? Yes, and yes. Okay. We have her listed as a non-voting non -voting member. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's Very okay. Good. Thanks, Lorraine. Sure. Would, yep. I believe she would be able to vote in lieu of Greg not being present for the vote. Okay. Okay. So your yes still remains a yes, Brianne? It does. It did not change okay. in these Very 15 good. seconds. Okay. Looks like the yeses have it. The ayes have it. So... I think we could move forward to our next agenda item. So, uh, Lorraine, can you, okay. Oh, very good, yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, was anybody able, anybody be able to get a hold of John at all? Is he still back on the line or looks like he's still having some difficulties? Apparently so. Uh, we can move forward to old business then. So the organized garbage collection initiative there. So Director DeAndrea, do you want to let us know what's happening with that? Update us, please. Sure. So I did provide a report in the um, your agenda, but just to briefly summarize. So we had talked to council. We had 19 applicants for the subcommittee made up of citizens that we had received. And so they had wanted that to be maybe about 11 people. And so council had directed staff to get um, a couple of paragraphs from each uh, applicant to determine why they wanted to be on the, on the committee. And we received uh, responses from 11 of those folks. So th that is planned to go back to council um, on June 22nd. The RFP has been drafted and is complete. It is at the city attorney's office for review. Um, she has been very busy, so that's been over there for several weeks, but I've um, asked her to try and make that a higher priority so we can get that out hopefully next week. But I think the timeline of that where the committee is hopefully formed around the end of June um, would coincide with when we would receive the proposals and then we would take the next couple of months to review those with the subcommittee and then start having some uh, uh, outreach meetings with the community, and then also study sessions with council to talk further. So our goal would be is to make a final decision towards the end of this year for implementation around June 1st of 2021, if there was a decision to move forward. So we've had a, a little bit of a delay from the, um, due to the virus, but not a whole lot at this point. And I'll scan Great. for any questions. Have you had any RFPs submitted as of this yet? <laughs> we haven't even put it out on the street yet. So I have met with um, several, pretty much all of the major um, waste haulers. I had done that back in February. And so they're all anticipating it and we will give them approximately five weeks to put their proposals together, but we haven't even placed it out on the street yet for them to respond to. Okay, Hopefully sorry. Go next week. Okay. I will just say that I continue to see on next door a certain amount of frustration occasionally regarding pickup. Some of it, of course, could be due to the COVID and all that, but there's still comments out there on different carriers not responding and so on. So in that sense, I think it's still ongoing, some of the frustrations with the 
trash situation in the city. So. Very good. So I think overall, Maria, basically what you're saying is that even though we've, there's been a sense of certain delay or postponement um, due to the virus and so on, but it's, the wheels are still in motion. It's still moving forward, still advancing at this time. That's correct. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Uh, does anybody else have any comments or questions, feedback on this issue? I think we, we've made rounds with this several times, so don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's just good to hear that this is still on the agenda, in my opinion, and it's, it's moving forward, so. Okay, very good. Um, so with that, I, I think we can move on to our next topic. Lorraine, what's next? So next we have the 25 miles per hour speed limit implementation. Guy, do you want to go through this or Maria? Well, I guess I could go through it. And also I just like to, I did talk to John and uh, he's still having technical difficulties. So I, I suggest him we're probably just going to have to table that or another time his his presentation so i just want to let you know that know that as well okay very good so i think the uh the next topic there guy i think uh as lorraine described it was was um, on you, was in your wheelhouse. Was that the 25 mile per hour there, Lorraine, or? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Would you like, would you like me to share my screen or just? I think it would be advantageous if you share your screen there, Guy. That's weird. Okay. Yeah, so we've just been continuing to look at the uh, uh, the 25 mile per speed limit. Uh, uh, our our staff did do a a survey of what uh, what kind of speed limit signs we have out we have out there to kind of determine what the uh, implementation would be. And we have uh, so I have proposed this memo that uh, it would not be a very costly implementation if based on the recommend uh, the uh, best based on the recommended implementation plan that we would well the next step would be to uh to for the, uh, for this uh this committee to uh make a recommendation and then we would continue we will work forward uh, uh work with uh the city's attorney the police department to finalize the language and then the the implementation plan uh the all the work is proposing is that we will add those guide signs those green signs indicate in the, uh, the, um, the, the speed uh, the speed uh, the speed limit throughout the city is 25 miles per hour unless otherwise posted. That would take approximately 25 guide signs. And we would also, uh, based on the information we got from the Cityway survey, we would there are 30 uh, 30 mile per hour signs that aren't really warranted, so we would start removing those. And in some cases, they would be replaced. With uh, 25 mile per hour signs, but not all of them. A lot of them would just be removed uh, as um, um, would just be removed. The ones that would be replaced would be like ones entering and exiting like hospital and school zone and uh, some roads that really shouldn't be some, uh, some clearly residential road, roads that don't need further further uh, speed study analysis. And then once the council adopted, we would move forward with that implementation and work with a uh, communication department to come up with an educational campaign as well. And there's the cost below, uh, our estimated cost right now. 
What does that say, remove unwanted signs? Is this supposed to read 5,500? I, that was, that was something that, I mean, that's 500, it's not supposed to be there. I don't know how that got there. Okay. And uh, in regards to the educate, educational component, um, I don't know if this Sorry. would be for Guy or for uh, Director DeAndrea, is that something that council, I mean, would it be the typical channels of the newsletter and so on to reach out to the city, the community? Yes, yeah, so the next step would be, um, I believe this would take, require an ordinance by the city council. So we'd probably bring this back as a study session first to talk with them, see if there's um, agreement from the city council and then an, an ordinance would require two readings. And um, with the communication plan, again, we develop that so that we could show them again, I think at the last in March, Guy had shown some kind of specialized signage that we would put up at these 25 locations. So our communications department would um, uh, do something, you know, to make them kind of stand out and unique. Is the speed limit already 25 by the hospitals? Probably in areas, I would guess. So, okay, because yeah, I wasn't here in March, but uh, I'm just wondering, I thought all the study and, and literature showed that there wasn't an issue with the 30 mile an hour speed limit. I don't believe there is. I think the desire, so I don't think it's a, a problem. I think the desire is, you know, if if we wanted to go to a 25, could we do that and what would be the cost? So I think okay. that's where guys coming from and um, that we could do this without, you know, um, a loss of safety or a degradation in safety at all. Okay. Yeah, it's perfectly reasonable from, from a traffic engineering perspective. Uh, even though we should follow into standards like the 85 percentile, this uh, adjusting the the base speed and uh, and even like in some places like in the medical district, changing the speed limit based on the fact that it's just the medical district is, is perfectly acceptable, even following uh, uh, traffic standards. But that's what it's currently, 25 in the medical districts, but you're talking about making it from 30 to 25 throughout the city, right? Actually, some of the middle districts where the pedestrians crossing are posted at tw are posted 20 miles per hour, and right outside of those 20 mile per hour zones, there's actually signs posted for 30 miles per hour, like on Old Hamden. So what would happen is the 20 miles per hour would stay the same; we would not change anything, and those and those signs that are posted out wide right out the zone to kind of actually technically to speed people back up to the 25 miles per hour. 30 miles per hour, not only removed, but those ones will be changed to 25 miles per hour. Under just I know, um, my, my question, I, I understand that, is why we're changing it from 30 to 25. This is uh, something that was proposed by by this, this committee. Oh, okay. I believe in the last meeting, we uh, went over some statistics and had a discussion uh, and then recommended that we have the city reach out and just do a study to see what it would actually cost if we were to implement something like this and, and what would implementation actually look like is another data point for us that we hadn't discussed previously uh, when we had been talking about this topic. I believe Othaniel may have brought this up uh, a few meetings ago. <laughs> and uh, so we were just kind of continuing the, the conversation okay. on this. All right. And, it, and if I'm not right on that, somebody please correct me. No, I think that that's accurate there, Chris. So um, this goes back to, I think, several years ago when the information provided from the city had an excess of, I think, $100,000 what the cost would be at that time to, to do, the, do this change. And um, so I think we've got some updated information from Guy providing us with that, what the actual cost would be um, and to, to make the proposed change from 30 to 25. So, um, but that has been kicked around, Patrick, from at least at the last 
meeting and I think possibly the last several meetings as well to discuss right. at several some points there. So I have a question for Chris Groth. Chris, is you and your crew, are they, how do they, how are they able to deal with this? Is that something sign making and all of that is something you guys can handle? If this change, uh, you, change happens. You know, Neil, we're, we're full go over here. All right. So, all We've been in your shop, so we know, we know you're capable. So, <laughs> but, uh, I just had to get some input from you and from your group too on your thoughts on this. So if that's something that the committee and the city decides to make a change on, then yeah, that would be good. Yeah, if we move there, we'll, we'll address some uh, adjust some priorities and we'll, we'll make it happen if that's uh, what moves to the top. Okay. Uh, uh, just oh, because, oh, because the cost has to account for the, uh, their time. These costs actually do account for their time, not necessarily for the workload, but for the time, uh, uh, the time a city, a city will expend on the, on the, in those costs. I've got sort of a piggyback question, and and how material it is to this, I I, I think it is a little bit, but partly because I just want to know. Um, in your shop, Chris, we saw you guys were reusing some signs there. You know, if we're going to pull down 50 signs, would we be able to reuse any of those for other purposes? Yeah, you bet. Those would uh, get resurfaced and recycled and uh, come back to us, and then we could resheet re those. Reuse them. All right. Okay. So, Guy, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? I mean, that's pretty much your, and um, I can't see it right now, but I can't recall if that memo was from you or was that from, from Maria? I think that was, was that from you, Guy? Yes, I drafted this up. There was some, okay. uh, I drafted this one up. Okay. Very good. Well, is there any additional conversation on this? Any, okay. Um, at this point, is that something that the committee would like to vote on or? Chris, you're kind of good with, you know, coming up with different um, motions, so. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I don't know, you know, personally, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm quite ready to vote or make a recommendation. Uh, you know, I've, this was an important data point and, and especially in our last discussions, you know, the pricing was significantly different and which definitely, uh, you know, played into some of the decisions we were making. Uh, you know, safety was one of the things we were looking at here and it, you know, it's pretty clear that uh, in general safety will not be impacted um, if, if not improved from something like this. Uh, you know, we need to, look at the holistic approach of what all is going to take place here, what needs to happen. There's still some things where this would maybe need to go to council for review. Uh, there would have to be some sort of action that allows for budget for something that, for this to happen, uh, you know, a prioritization exercise, all of these other things in the background. And, and you know, I'm, I'm more curious kind of where the group is on this. Um, we haven't met for a couple of months, so I, I know uh, Today, we haven't had that discussion about the topic specifically. We're just sort of presenting these numbers. But, um, you know, I've, I'm curious from two points of view, sort of the team, uh, you know, what what's on your minds about this? Is it something that we want to keep talking about? I, I think it's a good topic in general. Uh, but, you know, what does the team like to do for moving forward with something like this, whether it's action or no action? And then, uh, you know, if it was something we wanted to take action on, I'd be curious, maybe from a, a Daniel's standpoint to, you know, what he would like to see from us or what else might be required if we did want to move forward with something like this. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Nathaniel want to chime in on that. Yeah, I was just trying to get my son to close the door before I actually put myself off mute. <laughs> so, um, no, so for me personally, actually, this was, uh, this is something that I've been hearing from the community quite a bit. I've actually had a, quite a few people actually say that we're not going far enough with 25 and going actually down to 20. 
Uh, but I believe, obviously, if you look at some of the research that's out there that it does state, especially myself as a uh, runner and cyclist, I, you know, uh, taking on a, you know, getting into an accident with a car going 25 is much different than going 30 or, or anything higher than that. But anyway, so in terms of me, uh, obviously, just your input in terms of what your concerns are, whether it or not there is a recommendation, uh, I guess since this is going to be going to a study session at some point, I'm probably going to be asking for more community input on this. I, as I stated, I have received many citizens uh, provide me emails and just their thoughts on actually reducing it. So this is one of the items that's really top of mind for me uh, that I do want to see uh, changed uh, in the near future uh, because I do think it will make a big difference within the city itself. And I, I think at the last meeting we had a, a like a just a non-binding straw poll asking people what they felt, and and uh, we had most of the committee members there, um, and and everybody who was there, all the committee members who voted, I believe, uh, said that they were in favor of lowering the speed limit to twenty-five. Am I remembering this right? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that's the case. Yeah. So, would. Uh, I guess, Guy, this question would be for you. Uh, so is there something, some sort of a map or something that possibly could show the sum of the streets in the city that would go from 30 to 25 and what would possibly remain as well too? So people aren't confused. You know, we have collectors, arterials and so on. And some people that are don't have that background or knowledge about which ones, which streets would pertain to that 25 mile per hour change, it might be beneficial for them, might be helpful for them um, to do, to see something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I, I think sort of a broader picture, you know, what is council going to want to consider as part of this? And, and we should probably review that and, and understand what those things are before we make a recommendation on that as well. Yeah, I mean, it would be pretty easy because it, uh, to just draw up a map of what I would expect to not change. I mean, unless otherwise, unless we otherwise designate it, it's, it's, it would be a citywide speed limit of 25. So all we would really want to do is show where we uh, like, like Oxford and obviously Broadway and that where we would need us uh, because that I identify them as a collectors that would need analysis. So yeah, it'd be pretty easy to just Draw up a map of which ones we would not remove the posted speed limit from. from. But the, how the law is written, the would, would be proposed is everything that's not posted will be 25 miles per hour. So that uh, so, but we'll uh, uh, draw up a map showing where we would uh, want to keep the current posted speed uh, without without until until safety. A, a speed study supported lowering the speed uh, or we did some you know engineer improvements would be would be pretty simple because I think that would be one of the um, things that I, some people would be unclear on is the extent of it and by just saying that it's citywide it could be understood understood or interpreted to be of course um, you know the neighborhood streets you know, in that sense, but then does that carry forward into some other, as I mentioned, collectors or some other thoroughfares that they might think, well, this is, they didn't expect that to be a change here as well as a point of clarification. So. Yeah, I, and I have a question here too, you know, um, in the memo, it says uh, the city attorney and police department will work with council to get some language together. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious from a process standpoint, if it would make sense, uh, you know, if we're making a recommendation, I'm, I'm assuming the changes are gonna be relatively small. It's just something that amends, I believe amends model traffic code that we've adopted. And so it would be relatively straightforward, maybe not, but I, I just wanna make sure to Neil's point, you know, that there's not some sort of unintended consequence and that if we are making a recommendation for something that we sort of vetted it through so you know the ma map of the streets would be great and i think these are artifacts that are going to be needed uh for council anyway so i don't think we're necessarily 
creating extra work, just sort of moving it in the process. Uh, but if that's out of line for what we should be doing as the committee, then I don't want to, you know, bring that forth either. But that's just something I've got on my mind. I don't know how the rest of the group thinks about that. Maria. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, again, I think, and we can verify this, but that the process would be is that it's an ordinance amending the municipal code. So we have adopted the uh, model traffic code that applies to all of Colorado. And then if we want to modify that in any way, we do that through our own municipal code. So we could come back to you with that map and that proposed language if um, that would help. And then that would give you some more details about um, you know, what we're actually, or what you would actually be endorsing or recommending to city council. I agree, Maria. I think that would be very helpful for the group. I don't know if anyone else has any opinions on that. No, and just to jump in, I think uh, just something that may come in front of you guys at some point is that I believe the traffic code overall is being looked at by the city attorney at this point. So um, just a larger uh, rewrite that hasn't occurred in many, many years. So. Um, so yeah, this is something that's obviously also top of mind with the uh, city attorney's office. That sounds like a good agenda item for our next meeting. You get to talk about scooters. <laughs> good, we'll pull up our notes from last time. <laughs> okay. Very good, if there's anything else, the committee has any comments, questions, concerns here? I guess is that uh, is that a fair request, Maria or Guy, to sort of look at those those two items, the map and and sort of the suggested language? Is that is that an appropriate request for you guys, from us? Absolutely, yeah. And and to Mayor Pro Tem's point, the city this is on their radar, so we can bring back also any salient points of. So we, what we would do is adopt the updated um, traffic code. I think we've adopted the one from 1995, which sounds like it was recent and it's like, oh, that was 25 years ago. So um, we would be adopting the most recent one with modifications specific to the city of Englewood. So we'll talk with the city attorney, see what's the best method to do that. And then we'll, we could come back at the next meeting and talk more and, ha and have that map available as well. Great. I guess, is there is there anything else that the group thinks would be helpful to continue our conversation uh, that we haven't asked for already? Okay. Very good. Um, I think that uh, that concludes at least that topic right now. So we can move forward to the next agenda topic. Agenda item there, Lorraine. Okay. So did I just see John come back? Oh, I'm sorry. Guy, you mentioned that he's, we're going to have to um, couch that for next time, I guess, right? The walk and wheel that John was going to talk about. So uh, let's go move on. And I think right now we'll go to director's choice. So there you go. Director Maria, Maria D'Andrea, go ahead. Oops, there we go. Sorry about go. that, I was muted. Um, nothing else to report at this time, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We have continued during this time. Uh, we've been operating with basically half staff. That changed on uh, May 4th, we've basically been back to full staff for the most part within our essential workers. So all streets, fleet, traffic, and facility staff is back at 100% as of May 4th. Um, the Civic Center reopened to the public on Monday the 11th, just a few days ago. And so we're basically working on a recovery plan within the, the city to ramp back up to at some point when it's um, declared okay by the governor and Tri-County Health is to be back at full staff within the Civic Center and our other buildings as well. Okay, very good. One, um, one question I had, uh, 
Maria is um, what it just, I guess I'm not that I've forgotten what the budget cycle is and how that's how any of that might be affecting your plans. Yeah, uh, we've tried, we actually had a fairly extensive discussion with uh, city council on Monday evening about the capital improvement program for 2021. And we've had um, a couple of meetings over the last couple of weeks with planning and zoning commission. It's within their charter for planning and zoning to actually weigh in on the capital improvement program. So we do have a fairly limited amount. It's about 5 million um, that's allocated for our kind of our general public improvement program. So there's been a fair amount of discussion and I'd be happy to bring that back to you. Um, but we're a little bit ahead of the schedule actually that we were last year for the budget. Um, but still online to approve everything by October of this year. And According that would go, go into me. effect for the calendar 2021? Correct, yep, we're on a calendar okay. basis. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, very good. So I'd like to move on to other uh, city staff here for their, if they have anything to say at this time as well too. So Guy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, as Maria said, we're still moving along. Uh, um, the Oxford bike lane um, is about to start. Uh, the capital improvement, uh, improvement uh, department and public works is about to uh, about to get that going. Uh, and uh, so uh, we've actually installed a uh, a uh, a, can a smart grid camera that uh, has bike detection built in now. And I'm going to actually hand things over to Chris. Uh, he, about that and he also has something else to share. All right, Chris. Hey, so yeah, so I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can show you the grid smart camera. Let me see if I can do that here. I didn't mean to put you on the spot about the camera if you don't have No, that. no, I, I actually got it pulled up uh, on the remote session, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to show the remote session. I'm trying. It says I can't share while somebody else is sharing here. I need um, Lorraine to make you a co-host. Yeah. There you go. Give this a shot. Good, Chris. Yeah, let me give this a shot here. Okay, if you have any trouble, let me know and I can pull it up for you. Okay. Let's see. I don't. Ooh. I think I can. Uh, bear with me. Can everybody see that? Not yet. It says it started to sh share though, Crystal. So there you go. Yep. So everybody can see that okay? Yep. Very impressive. Is this live right now? Well, It is. So what this camera is, this is a one camera unit that hangs over the intersection and it is able to detect all four approaches at one time. Uh, vehicle detection, bicycle detection, um, and we can actually zoom in to each direction independently. Really cool. I, I would try to do that, but it's really laggy and I'd like to save that for a, a in-person session. Um, but in a nutshell, this is what the, the hardware looks like, and it is live view right now. We can we can adjust this right now on the fly if we needed to. Um, really, really neat. Yeah, this is so that Logan, the units, Logan um, and what, what's the intersection, Chris? What's the intersection? Is, Logan and... This is Logan and Oxford. 
Okay. And so we're preparing to deploy these at um, Broadway in Oxford and Oxford Windermere slash Navajo in preparation for that bike lane. Any questions on this, this device here? Yeah, um, what happens when it, it looks like uh, the little black boxes, you know, light up when it senses uh, something in there. What happens if someone is on a bike and is in the crosswalk area right there in between the middle box and like, for example, the green box that's lit up right now? Will it still sense them? Yes, this this particular unit has uh, algorithms built in to track a bicyclist. So once once the cyclist enters the image at the far back of the image, it is now tracking it from start to finish once it leaves. So if the cyclist is traveling westbound uh, and is waiting, it'll lock a call in and then service that person. So they could drop in between that area there and then still get service. I got to say, I'm glad to see this, Chris, because as a cyclist and a motorcyclist as well, it's kind of frustrating that you're sitting there at some of these intersections and you're not detected. And if you're the only one there for, then you're there for several cycles at least. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a plus that it's being able to capture uh, much more than previously just vehicles. Uh, I have another yep. question. And my my own, another uh, sorry, my own personal injury lawyer brain is thinking about all the ways this could be used. Obviously, um, is the footage uh, saved anywhere, or is it just a live stream? Just a live stream, no recording. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, Appreciate the. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if, real quick. If you guys got time, I'd show you some pictures of a newly installed crosswalk with some placemaking that we installed over off of uh, Dartmouth and Dartmouth Circle East and Dartmouth Raised Vine. Sure, uh, we've talked it. about this in our in our meetings here. Let me see if I can bring those up. Yeah, if I could interrupt, you guys may remember um, the woman from Dartmouth Circle. Uh, was it Emily? Emily Gonzalez. Yes. Yeah. So this is in response to that. So we finally got this installed, and and uh, Chris will show you a couple pictures here. It turned out really nice. Can you guys see that? Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I apologize. These pictures are going to kind of jump around between this location and the one to the east here. But this one here is the March Crosswalk and placemaking created at, uh, this is uh, Dartmouth at Race Slash Vine at this location here. And you can see the road has a pretty good crown in there. So those, those signs there are kind of, we straighten those out. So it looks a lot better, but let's see. Yeah. This is um, over at Dartmouth Circle East just to the east of that uh, race vine location. And you were looking to the east there, so that's the back. We created an artificial sidewalk, if you will, right in that area for, for um, pedestrians to get onto the sidewalk, which is just at the bottom of your photo there. My arrows. Okay, there's another view of race vine. Race Vine. There's a proud, uh, proud team member. Team member, we wrapped that up. Gave a little pose. Um, There's some of the install process.
And that this, is the place making there at Dartmouth Circle East. Headed and you can west. see in this photo how the um, how there's like planter beds and a steep angle there to the ground that would make it really hard to try to put in a sidewalk. Um, not to mention that you know the homeowners there wouldn't be excited about trying to install a, a sidewalk behind the curb. So I feel like this is a really great creative solution and um, has been extremely successful. Um, I, I live you know, just outside of where that photo is and uh, <laughs> in the background there. Um, and I've, so I've seen this a lot and heard from neighbors. People are really excited about it. Uh, that was going to, that was going to be one of my questions for Chris was, you know, when you guys were putting this in, did you have any neighbors come out and talk to you guys about it? Yeah, Greg was there. Um, and, and a couple other residents. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we did we have, send a letter in advance to notifying the people because we did have to remove some parking along that side of the street, but I don't believe we got any um, feed, negative feedback about that. Any questions, Great comments on, on these two locations here? Looks good. It's exciting to see these things happen and be implemented. Yeah, it yep. came out really nice. I'll just jump in. I've had heard positive feedback from people that are driving down Dartmouth about this. And so um, I actually wonder, and I'll probably take this offline with you, Maria, but I wonder why we don't uh, work with the communications department to kind of just show off. I, I think that this is really cool. So I definitely think that we need to get this out there and we've done this. Cool. Yeah. I think it's really cool too. Well, I like it a lot. Um, question, the these pillar sign holders, I guess I'm not quite sure, the metal um, things that we're looking at here, are they secured to the ground? Um, and have we had any cars hit any of them yet? So these devices are called delineators and they're all made of plastic and they're all bendable and actually break away. So they're designed to flex if they're struck. And the bases of those are bolted down. So yeah. the bases will stay, the units will flex and, and come out if they need to. Um, and then we reinstall a brand new post. And for at night is, um, I, I, I feel like I remember um, our, our discussion of paint colors when we were talking about these circles. Um, is the paint like reflective so that cars can see these at night? None of the circles are retro reflective only the the white edge lines are reflective and then the delineators have a white reflective piece of tape for the for that direction westbound for the for the direction of travel I think these are great yeah I got a couple more little details I want to run by guy I think since we have this test bed here um, I'll get a couple more pieces lay them on the ground get some more input um really excited to show that to guy and see if we can implement those uh come next time we do one of these great thanks chris you bet okay that kind of moves us into uh well actually i'd like to still go back chris are you done is there anything else you like to show us or is that it yeah i got lots of stuff but not for today <laughs> all right all right <laughs> i'll clarify for today got it um so i think uh, if we could go back so it would be i think sergeant mckay if he's still there yes i'm here thank you okay uh, is there i'd any... like to i'd like yeah, to go, go back ahead. on everybody else's comments the uh Dartmouth, Dartmouth Avenue is fantastic. If you haven't had an opportunity to, to ride by there or drive by there or walk by there, it's, it's a huge asset to the community. So thank you everyone that was involved. Thanks to the committee. I think this is just a huge step forward. The other comment I have is maybe including in the rec recreational street Floyd Place and a lot of uh, pedestrian and handicapped activity, uh, walking to and from the apartments there to King Supers recently. Uh, I'd like to 
even see if you could limit traffic there. There's a high accident location at Floyd Place and the university as they turn left from university. There's a lot of uh, T-bone crashes there. It's, it's really uncalled for. I don't, maybe we can think about limiting, you know, making a right, right turn only from east on Floyd to uh, southbound university and then no left turn onto Floyd Place. It's just a one, you know, a half, it's a short street and they're used, a lot of people are using that as a collector street to go down Floyd Place and for some reason they turn on race and then go on down to Floyd Avenue. So kind of uncalled for us. The other comment I have too is the, uh, you're talking about parking on Floyd at, or on parking in the city. And I was wondering about the parking on Floyd Avenue with the proposed impl implementation of the bike lanes, uh, which I'm all for considering, consider restricting or addressing the parking issues that are used by the tenants of the apartments. So they're using, you know, the city streets for their residential parking. I don't want to push them into the, into the neighborhoods by any means. They're the people that have the apartments are not using the apartment private parking, they're using the city as free parking. You know, taking up this, not so much taking up the park patron space because it's, they're parking there overnight more than during the day. It's just something to consider or maybe restricting that. You're talking about um, like Floyd between Franklin and Race at the Packy Romans Park? Yes, you all the way from yeah, Marion to, you know, yeah, to, to race, yes. Mushroom Park, whatever they call it, yeah. Yeah. Just this park. Okay. And I think they're going to redevelop. Uh, Maria, you probably know a lot more about this, but I think Romans Park is proposed to be redeveloped. Yeah, they're, we're replacing the retaining wall and then um, uh, replacing also the tennis courts over there this summer. So it's just, just some considerations I was throwing out there, some, you know, food for thought. Uh, Brianne here. Personally, I would 100% second that. Um, I, that's the way I come home from work when I used to leave my house. And um, first accident I've gotten to in a decade was I was hit right there on the corner. Um, and it's just, I mean, getting into and out of that King Supers parking lot, is just, you know, you, you go down Gaylord and it is, it's madness any time of the day. There are so many cars and there's just not enough space. And it doesn't, it, you're right, it's, there's clearly way more cars than there are patrons of those particular restaurants. And I think it's that um, Kent Place residences. It's like five or six stories tall that goes all the way around. Um, there are a lot of people there. Agreed. Yeah. Um, isn't this also part of um, on Floyd, there would be the larger question of the ca uh, traffic calming and so on that's the city's proposing to make happen there as well, too. Uh, well, there's a there's yeah, we've got we've got uh, I was trying to work with John and he, you've actually would have seen more of this in his presentation that uh, uh, we actually got a grant for specifically Floyd in the Lottie to uh, to start the traffic coming there with a mini roundabout with a roundabout but uh, I'm looking to the opportunity of it actually expanding and changing that grant into a larger project that uh, John had put the previous put together where we would actually uh, uh, create a uh, um, an what I, I think is best called the neighborhood bikeway or neighborhood way since it really benefits more than just bicycles. And, and we would try to run that, uh, the, the stripe in and like, uh, we'll be looking uh, during that project, we'd also be looking at those parking issues all the way to university is what, what, what I'm looking at trying to do as part of the next part, uh, a project that would, that would, uh, the, the Floyd proven project which will, would start uh, the design would start uh, this year. This anticipation. 
and a lot of those things would probably be addressed. I mean, if we have a broadside issue, we have a, pro a issue on university. We can look at we might look at that ahead of ahead of project. Uh, if we have a, a people are getting T-bone, but like a Floyd Place or a Floyd, we can look at that ahead of the project. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of interested in that Floyd Place uh, turning that to right turn only and sort of some statistics behind that. But I, you know, looking at what part of the neighborhood that would impact, it's, you know, really just sort of these apartments and, and about one block's worth of houses there. Um, so it seems like a pretty minimal impact, especially those apartments, they're already driving up Race Street. They can go another, you know, 250 feet and turn on Floyd Avenue if they need to go left on, on University. So I, I would love to explore that a little bit more. And I, I think mm -hmm. that sounds like a really easy place for us to make a difference there, especially from a safety standpoint. I think the, uh, the pattern that happens there is that folks are heading north on university and they see a series of cars coming towards them south on university and they want to make a left to get into the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done this before. I'll say um, I've seen situations where I know that if I wait to make the left on Floyd Avenue, then I might have to wait a while for the oncoming traffic. But if I make the left onto Floyd Place from Northbound University, then I can do that right now and just keep rolling into the neighborhood. Um, and I can, you know, that as I say it, I hear that somebody might be doing that when the oncoming traffic is a little too close and that's how, totally how it, I could see a T-bone occur there. Um, so I, I agree, there is, there is one block worth of houses and then there is a development, the um, Kent Village like condos um, or it's like uh, duplexes or something like that, um, that does have a fair amount of traffic um, I don't think that it's an age restricted community, but it does tend to be like 55 and over, um, something like that, 60 and over. Um, so. Can I, can I jump in there, Greg? Yeah. That, that, when that, uh, it's called Kent Village. When that community was developed, you're exactly correct. It was a more of a retirement, you know, 55 and, and up, where it was restricted to that. So there wasn't any children. They've now lifted those restrictions. So you do have a lot of, uh, families and younger people living there. Uh, when they built that Kent Village, they agreed to not use Floyd Place as a collector street. So they would they would not turn right from uh, on race onto Floyd. They would have to go to Floyd Avenue and uh, either go east or west. You can't go west, of course, to go east uh, on Floyd Avenue. So to minimize that, you could just have no right turn from, from race and that'll just be an educational aspect with the homeowners of Kent Village and their homeowners association and restrict it to however the traffic engineer deems safe. You know, considering, you know, emergency vehicles still have an access in and out, yeah. which is fairly easy to do. You could do a, you know, in engineer, I'm not, talking for the engineer, but do some kind of a, like a some type of a median or some kind of soft, you know, no left and a, either a right turn only or block it off. Yeah. Then you'd have to go to get to the residents to get their buy-in. And I don't think you'd have a lot of pushback. Yeah. That's, that's great additional context. Thank you. Um, yeah, it does seem like one way that we could experiment with this would be to put in um, to identify this as a potential street for the Recreation Streets program. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thanks. Miss uh, you guys, and on behalf of the Police Department, thanks a lot for your support. We're uh, we're all doing great. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Next, uh, Chris Groth. Do you have anything else, Chris? No, I don't, uh, but if you wanted to see some more software goodies, uh, stay late. <laughs> All right, maybe we'll bag it to next time. It'll be an ongoing okay. thing. It'll be a series. All right, Roger that. All right, excellent. Uh, Mayor Pro Temp Sierra? Yeah, uh, I'll be quick, guys. Um, I, I, most of the things have been covered that we that I wanted to bring up, but I guess uh, since you guys uh, did bring up the budget, uh, obviously we did talk about the capital budget for 2021 
and just a couple of things that are, you know, obviously it's not finalized, but a couple of items that came up that may interest you is just some of the traffic calming on Dartmouth, uh, um, ADA audits, uh, the city facilities. So um, a few things like that also was in favor of a walk and wheel plan, but obviously that was just, um, just initial discussions on some of the things that, um, that we're hoping to get accomplished in 2021. Okay, very good. Thanks. Uh, I think with that, we can move on to chairperson's choice. So I just have a few, few items to, to cover there. And the first one was actually the Emily Gonzalez email. And she had a very, very nicely worded email thanking the committee uh, for, for all of our support in doing that safe walkway that, that Chris had shown us there. So I want to just pass that along to the committee that uh, every, that uh, there's people out there noticing and that they're very appreciative of the work that we're doing. So I don't know, I don't know, Greg, if you were copied on that or not, but um, yeah. So, uh, so again, that's just something that shows that uh, some of our work is getting noticed and, and uh, thanked at the same time too by the, by the community. So, and then the other thing is just pretty much the city itself in terms of, I've noticed some of the things such as economic development and so on that the city's put forth to try to help out businesses in this time, as well as just, I think the community at, at large. And I think that's really great um, in terms of just, you know, the ability and then also the priorities to make sure that some of the most vulnerable businesses and so on are still looked after here. So I just want to, it's kind of a side note to the traffic committee here, but I, I'm seeing that and I just want to commend the city on that approach that you guys are doing there. Uh, and then just in general, just, you know, with this whole COVID that's gone on, I think that uh, it's been interesting to be out and about and do some of the cycling in the neighborhood and so on. And, and uh, particularly I was coming back from that Mary Carter trail going east on Dartmouth. And it was really something to see the bike lanes there. And I wish I could have took a picture of it, but I mean, it looked like a bunch of ducklings right in a row, but it looked perfect for, you know, some sort of a picture of just how well um, the city had done putting those those bike lanes in and I think how much the the people are really appreciating that too so again that stuff I think tends to show up and especially at this time you're seeing a lot more people being active out there and I think that's a good thing so but uh, that's pretty much it that's all I have so we'll move on to um, the committee rest of the committee and start from there uh, let's see Patrick you want to start with you no, I don't, I don't have anything else. Thanks. Okay. We're good. Uh, we'll go to Chris, Diedrich. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I guess the, the one other thing that we didn't talk about yet that I kind of wanted to bring up um, really piggybacks on a lot of the other things we've been talking about. And, and uh, this comes from some general conversations with neighbors and things, but it's more of a code enforcement type of thing. Uh, you know, a lot of people are out going for walks, uh, walking their dogs, just getting out of the house because going for walks is one of the few things we've been able to do lately. And, and uh, I've just been hearing from some people that, uh, you know, several sidewalks in the area, um, and I'm sure it's not just my little neck of the woods, but probably all over the place, uh, just overgrowth that makes it hard to walk on the sidewalks. And, uh, you know, I, this is always sort of a touchy subject because we don't want to be necessarily going out and proactively finding a bunch of people, but uh, you know, this kind of comes around every spring, things are going to start to grow some more and the stuff that's already overgrown on the sidewalks that make it impassable is, and, and for valleys as well, for that matter, um, this is sort of my annual statement on uh, please have good enforcement kind of keeping an eye on that. I don't know what the right things are that we can, uh, you know, pull on our end, maybe it's just, you know, suggesting they pay more attention or provide some warnings, but I've received a lot of feedback from neighbors about sidewalks having overgrowth on them um, lately. So 
I don't know how much discussion is warranted. If, if the rest of the group feels like that's something that they're seeing or hearing about, maybe we can make a suggestion that they code enforcement kind of looks at that. I'm not suggesting we find people, but maybe some warnings or, or notices or some sort of marketing around that I think would be appropriate this time of year. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that or wants to chime in, but that was the only item that I wanted to bring up. I'll jump in there, Chris. Uh, if code enforcement, they're, they're taxed for sure. Uh, the overgrowth mm. is, is definitely a problem. I've noticed it myself. Uh, mm. I, I understand, I hear you. I think our biggest uh, combat to that is public education, reminding the citizens, you know, they're responsible for those right of ways, public right of ways, the alleys, keeping them clear. So I will get with uh, Dave Lewis, who's the communications, or uh, sorry, code enforcement supervisor, to get with communications push out an educational uh, reminder to the citizen about their responsibilities for the uh, keeping the sidewalks clear and uh, alleys. It, it is a huge problem and it's, it's not going to go away, but hopefully we can mitigate it and get that voluntary compliance. As everyone knows, our sidewalks are extremely narrow. They're, they're outdated. There's not a lot you can do there. It's, you can't even put a wheelchair down a lot, most of these residential sidewalks. So it is an issue. I'll bring it up. I, if you have a specific complaint, just you can uh, call code enforcement and we can address those too on a case by case basis. Uh, that sounds Brian, great. Uh, Brian here. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, my property actually does. Um, I'm the corner on an alley and when I moved in, it was super overgrown with um, shrubs and trees and stuff. And I actually had to look up and figure out, you know, what the zone, what the code enforcement said, how, what that, you know, that you measure the 25 feet back and then the, if anybody knows what I'm talking about in the alley. Anyway, that you have to have it clear from there. I would love for, um, and now I'm, I'm putting up a new fence, so I'm doing this a lot, but it, I would love for if we put out something, if it could have a graphic on there that says, you know, because you can easily, you know, walk out 25 feet to an alley and figure out exactly where you have to have it trimmed. Um, and once I did that and cut it back, I, I had more than one neighbor stop by and say, thank you. This has been so overgrown and you can't see traffic coming this way. My garage isn't over there, so I never drive down the alley. Um, and I think that just like a simple graphic could make a big difference because I feel like most people probably just don't even think about a large bush that could be in the sight line of something if they never drive there. Yeah, I, I, Brianna, I totally agree with your comments. And I, I think, uh, uh, Sergeant McKay, that's uh, the right thing to do is it's really a public education type of thing. Uh, you know, it doesn't really help us to go around and give a bunch of fines. And, and a lot of people just aren't aware, you know, to Brianna's point, maybe they don't ever drive down the alley because they don't ever have to. Or maybe if they do walk on the streets, they're typically walking one direction to the grocery store and don't realize their bush is blocking the sidewalk the other direction. So, I, you know, I think that'd be a great approach. And I really appreciate you uh, offering to take the lead and, and, you know, get court enforcement teed up on that. That'd be great. I imagine that this is probably a larger problem now at this time, spring comes around and of course it just catches people off guard as to how quickly things can sprout, bloom, grow. <laughs> and, um, and they might get caught off guard occasionally with that. But uh, yeah, I fully agree that if you notify them or let them know with code enforcement to give them that opportunity to address it, that would be very helpful on that. So. Yeah. yeah, we'll get that pushed out. Good. Okay. That was all for me. Okay, Chris. Uh, Tiffany? Um, I don't have anything for this meeting. Okay. Brianne? Uh, yeah, the only thing I'd, I'd written down here was, um, Mayor Pro Tem, you talked about how the city attorney might be revamping the model traffic code. That's something that I use in every municipality constantly. Um, I, if we are, if we can have an impact on that and look at it and be able to talk about it um, before it goes out, I, that would be just wonderful. Okay. 
Well, all right. Thanks. Thanks, Brianne, on that. So I don't know if Mayor Pro Tem's here is there, uh, but we'll definitely note that. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, Greg? Um, Brian, do you have uh, Mayor Pro Tem's email? It might be good to follow up with him that way. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. I'm sure it's on there. Just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, he would be on the um, on the email that went to all of us. Um, I just want to say thanks to Officer McKay. Um, there, were, I I've seen. I imagine lots of us have experienced the situation of um, increased speeding. Now that there's fewer cars on the road, the cars that are there seem to be going a lot faster. Um, and so there were a lot of complaints about that on Nextdoor, and I was um, trying to encourage folks to uh, get the speed trailers out there. And so there was some confusion about that. And uh, Officer McKay and I had a conversation just confirming that they're still being used. They're out uh, regularly and that people can call in to get them placed. So thanks for your help with that. Um, and I just want to, I guess, for anybody who isn't aware about the speed trailers, they exist. <laughs> um, there's a page on the Englewood website about um, speed enforcement where, where uh, I think it's your, your numbers listed there, Officer McKay. So um, people can just call you directly and uh, it, it goes to you and they can get placed out there and they help to collect data. They help to reduce traffic while they're out there and they help with education for the folks who drive on that street regularly. So they're somewhat helpful um, in uh, getting folks to pay attention to speed limits and also in identifying areas that might need engineering changes to um, help folks to travel the actual speed limit on a street. Thank you. Yes, they're out there. They're, if they're not out there, that means they're being charged. So, but yeah, they'll be uh, placed again, they're gonna be re relocated again on Saturday. So they'll be out, they're getting charged right now. It usually takes a day or two to charge those, download the data, and then we'll deploy them back. But yeah, shoot me an email, call me, have your uh, contingents or call. Let me know where the issue is, a perceived issue, and we'll get it out there. Anything and that's else, it for Greg? Me. No, okay, that's it for great. me. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, okay, I think that's it. Let's see here, committee members choice. Yes, I would like to uh, again, thank everybody for, for coming in this, this virtual meeting. Uh, my question is for the next meeting and Lorraine, maybe you can help out with this. Is that something that the city is considering now going back to our in-person meetings or is it still gonna be virtual by you think the next time this comes around or what are the, what are the committee thoughts on continuing at least another month or two of in this capacity. I don't know. I'm just kind of pulling for what everybody thinks would be acceptable moving forward here. Is this something that we would want to pursue at least for the next meeting? So Neil, yeah, it's, my, it's my understanding through the city clerk's office that until further notice, and Maria, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we will be doing um, meetings via Zoom. Okay. Very good. And yes. Aside from um, the, you know, the issues with John uh, audio that, you know, like that's an obvious um, thing that, that detracted from our ability to communicate tonight. But I feel like overall, this is a pretty good way for us to work, um, especially right now. And even if um, we were to go back to, um, you know, some folks meeting in person, if the city were to say that that's an option, I would hope that the city would also consider doing like a hybrid setup where folks in the room are in the room and folks who need to participate from a home can do that in case somebody has some reason why they're a higher risk population just so that they can continue to participate in uh, public meetings without having to put themselves at a higher risk. Yeah, I, I agree. This is kind of a very fluid time, I would say, for people being able to approach whatever meetings and encounters there are in a certain sense. Um, so whether it's, you know, doing the in-person thing, but with some sort of criteria on distancing and and all that, or, you know, if it's still, I think more appealing for many to just say, we can do this virtually, whatever. Um, you know, there's considerations that some, some have more than others, I would say, if, if there's someone in a vulnerable category and all that. So um, I would definitely like to make it optional for people to continue to, to do this from home or from wherever they feel comfortable. 
So, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. I was, I think that Jennifer dropped off the line. She was, um, she was hanging on for a while there, but I was going to see if she had anything left to say, but I think that finishes it up for ETAC for this month. So thanks everybody for showing up and uh, be in touch. Thanks all right. again. All right. We'll see everybody. Take care. Thank you. All. Bye.